Gig Gab, episode 394 for Monday, August 28th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab for everyone who has listened a little bit before. <sighs> After a crazy week off, some time in Denver, I think I played seven gigs since we talked last. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Capitola, California, Paul Kent. How, uh, how are things in Capitola? It was a spectacularly beautiful day today. Went for a nice walk on the beach uh, at lunchtime today. And life is good. Played a lot of gigs last weekend. Got a lot of gigs coming up this weekend. Nice. Probably too busy. I think last weekend and this weekend are Wednesday through Sunday. Oh, no, no, I want no. I, it was Wednesday through Sunday, one day off, and this week is Wednesday through Sunday, one day off. So Man. a lot of good gigs going on. That's good. Yeah, I had uh, the, the right after we talked last. I had it turns out I had five gigs in less than forty eight hours. Like I, I started. <laughs> The first one uh, at like 6.30 on a Friday night. And I finished the final one at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon and, uh, and at five in the middle two two midnight Rocky horrors in there. But um, which, which is how the timing of that could possibly even work. But um, it was, it was fun. I like, I, I actually had a good, good weekend and it, it, it evolved in a sense. Uh, the first gig was a, monkey fist gig acoustic gig right down the street from my house here and the weather looked great until we got set up and we were just about to start and then yet again the summer of 2023 kicked in and it poured so we brought the speakers under the tarp under the tent uh waited that out for about 30 minutes then we played for about an hour and yet again the rain started and it was like oh that's the end of the first set just like the uptown gig i did a few weeks ago um, the crowd stuck around. It worked out to be a really fun night. Everybody had a blast, but it was just like, you know, working, working with the rain and then packed up from that and went and played the first of the, uh, midnight Rocky horrors of that weekend. Um, uh, and those two, those two Rocky horrors went really well. That was, uh, it was the second weekend of it. And it was the final weekend that my friend Julius, uh, was playing, I get the feeling that it was probably the final time that I will play with him at that theater. He, he, he was doing this sort of as for fun in between. He just got off the road with the Broadway touring production of hairspray as the conductor and keys one. And he is heading out on the road. In fact, he's in rehearsals now as the music director and conductor and keys one for the Broadway touring production of mean girls. So um, I'm stoked. Nice. I'm stoked for him. Yeah. And it was a blast. He, I played his first real pro, you know, that he was paid for a theater show together with him. We did spring awakening a number of years ago. We did a bunch of madhouses together over the years. Um, and other shows too. We did Tommy together. And so it was, it was fun to like have a moment where we, we got to play together again. Cause it's been a long time. So it was like, all right, you know, it's like, I, I don't know if that's why he chose to do this, but it certainly was the reason I chose to do this. this uh, was you know just to get to hang and 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 jam out, and those Rocky Horror tunes are fun to. That's you know it's just it's rock and roll, and we were on the stage, so we got to perform a little bit together, which is it's always nice. Cool. Um, Bitter Pill had an interesting week, it, a good weekend, but it, but it was interesting. It'd been a, it, probably five or six weeks since Bitter Pill played, and we played uh, Saturday afternoon, and then again on Sunday afternoon. Saturday afternoon was a uh, kind of, I I would call it a, like a downtown. uh, We played in the, the sort of town green of this, this uh, town, Berwick, Maine, which is right over the border. Uh, They do this once a year. They call it their lawn chair festival where everybody brings their lawn chairs and hangs out on the town green. And there's like, it's a variety show all afternoon. They have bands playing, they have people, you know, doing acrobatics and, you know, dance troops and the whole nine yards really well organized great stage great sound system a fantastic crew but it's a festival vibe right so it was like okay cool how much time do we have between the act before us and us and they're like five minutes i'm like okay so at what point before that five minutes starts am i able to put my drums on stage and they're like right good question we've thought about that too 25 minutes before you start you'll be able to bring your drums up on stage 
and we'll get them mic'd up. And then there's like right before you is somebody that's on stage. So you have to kind of like clear out. And then there's one other thing and then you go. And it was like, okay, like they had thought about it. It sounded insane and it was a little bit, but it was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll build my drum set, you know, off stage here while the other acts are happening. And then they had crew, they helped me bring it up. And it wait, was- wait, did you not know this till you got to the gig? I mean, I kind of knew that it was one of these things. This is the second year we've done it. Um, I knew to trust them enough to ask. Like I, I, I was pleasantly surprised that they had answers for everything for me this year. But it, like I, I knew that that they probably thought through most of these things, and in fact, they thought through all of them. They were like, by the way, here's the Wi-Fi password for the mixer, so you can mix your own ears, and you're going to be in this channel. It was like great. Okay, so like they they took care of us. It was it was great. But it was still one set at a festival gig and we had to like, you know, get on stage and get off stage. And so it was it was not relaxed in terms of the, you know, the 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 vibe. Right. It was it was squeezed in like like those gigs are band played really well. Like we were we were great at really, really great. We played well, but it it was it was that type of sort of, you know, uh, higher tension vibe, you know, more compressed time. We were on someone else's schedule. I know it. Yeah. yeah, I know it very well. Right. And yeah, exactly. And it w- it went great. And I think because it went great, really even helped the next day. The next day we played at this farm uh, near us. The, the, they call it the farm at Eastman's Corner. We played there a bunch. We started playing there during like the, the, just as lockdowns were kind of opening up during 2021. We played there a bunch during the summer of 21. We played there last year and of course this year too. And so it feels like home ish to us. You know, we're used to being there. We're the only band playing for the afternoon. We get to basically set our own schedule and it's, it was like chill and we got to just be bitter pill. We played two sets and as we went up for the second set, we sat down and I want to make sure I'm clear about this, that like nobody in the band was like, you know, falling down drunk or anything like that. But everybody had had a beer or whatever. And when we sat down to play the second set, it was like, ah, yes, everybody's just a little bit chill. We're already warmed up because we played a great first set. Now we're coming up to take the stage for our, our second set. And the band was just loose and happy and everybody was locked in. It was like, ah, oh, yeah, I missed this. You know, like it, it was, it was good. You know, it was it a completely different vibe from the day before. So the weekend definitely evolved. Then of course, in between the two better pill gigs I, on Saturday night, I had uh, another Rocky horror. Cause that's, you know, that, that's what I was mm-hmm. doing that weekend. So that's how I squeezed five gigs into, into 48 hours. But um, yeah, but it was good. Oh, and then I like on Saturday morning, I drove my niece to Boston to, get on a bus to go because she's going to Greece for um uh, it'll take study, a long time by bus study abroad what's that it'll take a long time by bus yeah they haven't built a tunnel yet she was uh, taking the bus down to vis- visit her ah. friend that she's going with in southern Connecticut and then they they got on a plane a couple days later um but it was just like yep wake up early Saturday morning go drive to Boston drive back throw my drums in the car go play the gig <laughs> at the festival you know it was one it was one of those weekends like you know i know we all have them but um but it was it was fun like i i i did not dread any part of that weekend i mean the rain on on friday night was sort of a a a bear to deal with just because it was like come on again like again yeah (laughs) but otherwise it was yeah yeah you know it worked the gig worked out okay no equipment was damaged that we know of you know it all seems to work so far i'll knock on wood Cause we got a gig on Thursday that's using some of that yeah. gear, but yeah, no, it's good. It's fun. Something to do. So we played, um, we played the gig you played with us a couple years ago. Oh, at the racetrack or whatever, or the car show or whatever it was at the car show. Yeah. yeah. We played that. We did, we did two one hour sets, 11 to 12 and one to two easy peasy. And then we ran down for a corporate private gig, uh, in the evening and man, that corporate gig was something else. I mean, it was a corporate gig in that, you know, it's, yeah. you know, you're, 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 it's not all about you, but it was the 90 minute gig, two sets in a 90 minute gig. What? So, oh man. Yeah, so how long yeah, was the break? <laughs> just 10 minutes, which is fine. But I okay. mean, yeah, still, you know, yeah, that's tight. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, that was a great house rocker weekend. And I had, I had some acoustic time as well. And, uh, I don't know if you saw this. I don't think we've done a show on this, Dave, but, um, I am self-diagnosed musical ADD. Okay. My ability to let's say, did you see I posted something on my podcast? I did. You've said that on the show before. I like this. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. So literally I, I go through like, I, I use, you know, my Apple notes and I, and I constantly are running set lists and song ideas and all these types of things. And I went back and looked through my songs to finish page and there's 136 songs on there oh, wow. that I have started started in some way, shape, or form. And you know, to me, finish is like brain dead, locked in. You know, go perform it. Like I might perform it before it's before it's finished, finished. But it's probably got to be at least 80 or 90 percent ready. To like you know, I might need to like sneak a peek at, a peek at some words, you know, something like that. Or one part I know is going to be a little rough, and I might you know take a simpler route, you know, from the from the music standpoint. But anywhere in this 136 songs are played at once. That'll probably be a cool thing. 10% ready to, you know, almost ready, 90% ready, but 136 freaking songs. And, you know, I'll hear, I'll be working on something. And in my mind, you know, it, it's like a, it's like a reality TV show in my mind, another song will pop in. I will have this inner monologue, like, don't do it. Don't go down yeah. there. You're busy. <laughs> You're doing something. But I don't know. This might be the one, this might be the magic song that, you know, really gets people crazy. And, uh, but again, the, the inner voice is going, don't go there. Don't listen to it. But sure enough, I'll give in and I'll go down the road, add it to the list, play it through once or twice, you know, need to do it later, you yeah. know, type of thing. Right, right, but, right. Yeah. But I determined, so I, I put this on my social media. For some accountability. Kind of like, yeah. Exactly. That's the word accountability. Yeah, and so I said, you know, I've got a problem. I need to work on it. I have so much music I want to play for people. I got to do it. Here's some stuff I'm working on lately. And then I went, and one of the ones that I was doing is, is a John Mayer song, No Such Thing, which is a really fun, but John Mayer chordal, you know, complex song to play. And I like, I, I have to get this one ready. So I worked on it some more, put up a brief, very informal video of me, you know, working on it, which I'd give it about a 70%, you know, good rate, but sure. good enough, kept working on it. Performed it twice this weekend. I think it's about 83.6% right now. Nice. On the way to being. And again, once it's locked in and I don't have to think about it and I can just emote it, then it's then it's in the set for a long time. And uh and I'll enjoy it. But yeah, working on my musical ADD is 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 a big focus for this this fall. So well, but I think like the fact that you've gotten that you've played it out, like to me, that means it's I know that it, that a song continues to evolve in terms of how we know them and all of that good stuff, right? I, I'm, I don't mean to be dismissive of that because I, I certainly experienced that too. But like once you've played it out, that to me is like a really big moment of of its evolution. It's like once you're ready or even not ready and you wind up just playing it, uh, like then to me that that t that's where the stress disappears for me. Well, I, I, in theory... But, you know, if you play it and you don't like what it sounds like to you or you don't get any reaction that you're expecting, it's very easy to shelve it and say, oh, well, that, didn't, that one didn't work out. There's a better one I can go after. So sure. the stick-to-itiveness and, and making it good is actually the, that's the challenge. Actually, probably the last, the last 15% is probably the hardest 15%. Interesting. Taking it from, taking it from serviceable, like you can get the chords done, you can get through the song, you know the words. But, you know, getting it to where it really grooves and it really connects, that's that's a certain level of comfort and confidence and, you know, performance confidence that that makes it stick. So I get what you're saying. Yeah. Once you get it on stage, you're now committed to it. Why wouldn't you? Go? But but I have I've experienced both. Well, I, I've experienced no, the no, I, I agree with you, I, because to me, once I get it to the point and it, it, this is, you know, with a band or whatever, you get to the point where you bring a song and you play it on stage. At that point, the song's going to tell me whether it sticks around or not, right? Like, you know, you play it once, twice, maybe three times. And if by the end of that third one, it hasn't taken the leap into, oh, yeah, this is like, this is working. You know, the first time out might work great. And when that happens, it's lovely. But it doesn't always, right? You, you know, it's like, oh, I've got a little bit more to work out here. Okay, fine. Like, I'll, I'll figure this out. If I'm singing it, it's like. Right. I got to I got to learn how to sing that part better. You know, whatever, like the things that playing live teaches you about any any given song. But but by then it's it's going to happen. Right. I know I'm going to give myself or the band two or three times to play it. And after that, it has to stand on its own or it falls off the list forever. Like, that. I don't know. 
That's that's how well, I. Well, you're kind of say. Well, you're kind of say what I'm saying. I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I I will say that one my one of my the ways I'm trying to address this this musical ADD is to give it better than two or three times, mm. right? Like like I I really want to, and the, and the the music I'm choosing to, to lead me through that is like it's it's Dave Matthews stuff, which is actually quite challenging Hard. to play. And you're going to put a lot of time yeah. into that before. It ever rolls out the first time. That's for sure. Right? Yep. Yep. And, and again, you know, if you if you roll it out too early, you discourage yourself. And if you roll it out, you know, if you wait too long, you, you know, you might lose the, that. Hence the 136 yeah, you know, right. items on my list. Right, right. So right. I'm just more committed to like giving these songs a good chance and not adding to this list. And it's so funny. I, I posted, I have 136 songs. And of course, one nice lady who comes to see me says, well, what about this song? I go, okay, 137 <laughs> songs. 137, so, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get to it in about nine years. But, you know, anyway, so that it's a little bit of my quest. But I actually think that the, you know, the quest, whether it's a solo or, you know, small combo or a full band, a good example is we've been playing The Bitches Back, the Elton John oh, song. Oh, great song, yeah. Great, great song, right? And um, we've had it in our list. We've had a chart for it for a long time, a horn chart for it. And it was never butter. And I'd say maybe two or three years we've had it, and it's never been butter. Oh. And all of a sudden, this year, we decided to pick it up again. And and even the first couple of times we played it this summer, it wasn't butter. And then it clicked, and it's just killing right now. And I'm really glad we stuck with it. So there's certain satisfaction with, instead of like, you know, waiting for the song to tell you, there's a certain satisfaction to willing your good, like we've always said, the, the you know being a cover band is is an exercise in proving yourself right that the songs you choose <laughs> and the, right so no, i think that's true. kind of what this is yeah yeah so the satisfaction of sticking with it until you get the song right is uh is it's very satisfying so i i'm, I'm trying to experience that with my solo stuff and i have a little bit of experience with the band stuff to say sure the the journey is is the reward i i have two questions about this though I, like the first is like a question for for a later episode I, I want to. I want to know how. I want to hear how this this path that you that you're choosing, as opposed to letting the songs tell you, where you're being a lot more intentional about tweaking them and and sort of maybe willing them into a position where they deserve to be on the set list. Right. I want to know how that goes versus the let the song tell you thing. Cause, cause I'm, I'm truly curious. Like I've only ever, yeah. I've generally have only ever done the one thing there have been, you know, probably outlier songs over the years. Where it's like, no, we got to get, this one has to work for some reason, whatever the reason, you know, and then you sort of force it into place and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But the, the other question that I have, which is very much related is why do you think um, that Elton John tune, the bitch is back? Why is that? Like, do you, can you point your finger at a reason that it's better it's actually good now, whereas in the past it it didn't make the cut. I think it's such an aggressive song that that the temptation and also the anticipation of it, the the temptation to rush it from the start oh, is there. Oh, yeah. So the discipline to get the tempo exactly right. It also, you know, it is this kind of really chunky, you know, guitar lead. You know, the drums and bass have to be really relaxed and not overplaying in that, you know, because otherwise it gets kind of cacophonous. Yeah, if everybody is is playing yeah. the energy level that the keys and the guitar are playing, it, it right. will it will not groove. I that I, right. I totally understand. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I would actually say, you know, in in, in total transparency, me finding the vocal phrasings that work for me. So if you if you think about a new song that you're rolling out that everyone instrumentally is not feeling it right. And they're not hearing the vocal really butter. Yep. You lose a little confidence. And totally. so I kept working it and kind of found my way to, you know, there's some phrasings that Elton John and his, in his British wisdom, you know, are very natural to him that, you know, I have to work around and find something that works for me. Nothing that changes the song in any dramatic way. Just, you know, there's a, there's a word here yeah. or a breath here or something, that type of thing. Right. Totally. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, I think it's a combination of all those things. It's tempo. It's, it's you know, it's how to relax and let a good song be a good song and fighting your way through the little things that are holding the song back, which are overplaying, you know, phrasing of vocals, you know, even in a, in a, in a really like massive song like that. 
there actually is space in interesting ways. You know, like of like course, that, of course, that chunky yeah. that that chunky guitar riff that you know set, that comes in three or four times during the during the song. You have to not you know play on top of that. And if everybody, like you said, if everybody is not respecting that space, it doesn't feel right. And then you just kind of lose confidence that it's a good song for you. It's in there. You just, everybody's got to get a, get to a place where they've listened to it enough. They really recognize what they've got to do in that song. And that's, that's how you play, I say play any cover, but I think if you're going to take on challenging covers, you really got to critically listen to it as to what makes that song, that song and, and kind of respect the, the lessons that are in that. All right. Hey, look, we remember all those albums that changed our lives forever, right? I know most of us here can point to a specific song or certainly a band that inspired us to pick up that instrument or write music for the first time. So if you like to wax nostalgic about those magic moments, there is a show for you. Waterproof Records podcast with Jacob Givens. Jacob is an actor, a comedy writer, and musician out of L.A. who found himself making videos online about his passion for music. And after having his videos seen by millions of people around the world, Jacob started the Waterproof Records podcast, which in his own words are your unsinkable tunes from the past, present, and future. I like this. Waterproof, unsinkable, get it, right? Yeah. On his show, he reminisces about albums from his impressionable teenage years in the 90s, but occasionally invites fellow music lovers and musicians on the show to share their favorite first time listens. It's really fun to listen to. I've checked it out and Jacob's enthusiasm is absolutely infectious. So go check out waterproof records with Jacob Givens streaming on every platform available. You can find it wherever you find your podcasts and our thanks to Jacob for doing the swap with us. So Paul, I mentioned that I had those five gigs in 48 hours and I knew that sleep was going to be, uh, something that was challenging for me and uh, and needed to be like intentional and all of that. And that was fine. You know, I, I carved out my schedule. It was like, okay, yep, I can do this. One thing that happens to me, uh, and I, I've noticed this as, this is definitely, you know, old man musician talking here. So uh, I know you wouldn't understand any of this, Paul. You're, you know, you're spring chicken <laughs> here. <laughs> um, I wind up after if... If I'm not really careful, and sometimes even when I am, I will wake up after gigs, even just one gig, let alone two in the same day, uh, and you know, one at midnight, I will wake up with massive leg cramps. Like just wake, you know, like I wake up and it feels like my leg's gonna snap in half. I gotta like get out of bed and stretch. It's an awful way to wake up. Uh, it also happens in the middle of the night, so it doesn't, you know, it interrupts my sleep, which I didn't, I couldn't really afford. And so I started, I started researching, actually, I started, I think it was even the weekend before I was like, I I think Tums will help. I don't know why I thought Tums would help. And then one night I was like, wait, why do I think Tums will help? Like, I'm not like, I've never, I have no recollection of ever hearing anyone say that like Tums are good for this. I think I just like saw them in like my sleep deprived stupor one night and I chewed a Tums while I was like walking around in the bathroom trying to stretch my leg out to go back to sleep. And eventually I did. And I know the trick of eating a banana and I do that too. And it's fine. But you know, if I eat a banana before bed, it doesn't keep these things from happening perfectly. You know, it's, and so I did some research. I started tugging on the thread of this with the Tums thing first. And amazingly, Tums is like at the top of the list of every cyclist like blog that you can find out there for people that suffer re- like leg cramps regularly. Right. Cause I guess cyclists deal with this a lot. So it's like, Oh, I, maybe somehow my, you know, sleep deprived intuition was correct. Okay, cool. What else do they take? I started asking. And certainly there's, you know, the, the various um, like hydration, uh, supplements that you can add to like water or w- whatever, like, you know, liquid IV or the Pedialyte or all, you know, all that stuff or whatever. And, but what they really, what was number two on most of these lists is something that I'd never heard about before called Enduralites. Now you can't buy Enduralites on Amazon. You can only buy them from this company like Hammer Nutrition or something. I haven't tried those cause I didn't have time. I, I needed to get this stuff. Like I had like three days before this five day weekend was coming up. So I found an alternative on Amazon called highlight now i don't recommend you put anything into your body i'm just telling you what i'm putting into my body and these highlight capsules 
plus a little bit of Tums just to, for good measure to chew. I did not wake up with leg cramps once after the first weekend of, of Rocky Horror where I was waking up with them, you know, because I, I wouldn't go to bed till like three or four in the morning. And I'm, of course, dehydrated and like all this stuff from playing and from not sleeping. That happened the first weekend. And since then, including my five gigs in 48 hours, no leg cramps whatsoever. Wow. Yeah, man. Good for you. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, do you ever, like, is that a thing you've ever suffered from leg cramps? Like, I don't know if, I, like, you know, I don't know. No, very rare, but I actually have. And, you know, literally waking up with a knot in my calf or something like yeah. that. Like, su super painful. Super and, painful. Um, yeah. It sucks. It, not, not consistently, but I've, I've experienced on occasion and, you know, I never knew, I didn't know that it was connected to dehydration. Yeah, it's dehydration, but not just like water. It's all of the other stuff that, for me at least, it's all the other stuff that I sweat out that, you know, the magnesium and the 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 salts really is, you right. know, the various different types of salts. And this highlight stuff, I, you know, I, obviously I looked at the ingredients before I ordered it and put it in my body and it, it's got stuff that seems decent to me and obviously all the reviews look good. So, um, again, you got to decide what to put in your bodies, folks, but. As soon as I found this, I was like, oh, we're definitely doing an old man musician segment on the show. Like, I, <laughs> I have to share this. Like, this is this is a game changer for me. This has been something that's pl been plaguing me. I'm 51 now. This has been plaguing me for probably the last 15 years. And I feel like I've found at least, I mean, it's I'm only two weeks in. And I'm not taking these regularly. Like, only on gig nights. I'll, I might have a, a, they say that you can take 10 in a day. And that you should take one an hour while you're like cycling or whatever. I don't do that. I took one before the, the, like I would leave for the gig that night. If I remembered, then I would take one when I got home, have some water, probably have some food. Cause I'm, you know, I've been out and playing and I'm hungry. So I'll have some food and then I have another one before I go to bed and that's it. So like at most three, maybe if I'm forgetting one, four in a 24 hour period, but only on gig days. Like I'm not taking them. Like I didn't take one today. I didn't even think about it. You know, it's just, just a gig thing. So for me, that's how I'm doing it. That's how it's working for me. I know all of us have different bodies, but uh, you know, it's got magnesium, potassium, sodium, zinc, all the, whatever you're supposed to have. They figured it out. So Interesting. yeah, man. Well, glad yeah. you, glad you conquered that. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm winning the battles. I hope I've won the war, but we'll, we'll see, you know, it's, right. um, cause I've, I've like gone nuts coming home from gigs and like hydrating, like crazy, having coconut water, whatever. And then I'm up peeing all night. Cause you know, obviously that's how that works. And so it was trying to find this balance of, yes, I know I need to put liquid back in my body, but it's not just the liquid. It's, you know, I'm, I'm losing these other things that are, that are also important. So yeah, I was, I was I'm, I'm really excited about this. I, I hope, I hope I've licked it. Jonas wrote to us about something we talked about in 392 he says uh we were talking about tempo creep and he says i've seen some video of our shows and it has become painfully clear that we are speeding up our songs any wisdom i can take back to the band other than the obvious practice with a click get a click in your ears is there any cowboy wisdom you can share <laughs> i don't know that we have cowboy wisdom paul but um, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I don't know that they're going to help, but, uh, I'm happy to share. Do you have, uh, uh, you know, do you have anything to share, Paul, any thoughts on this? So do you read from his message that the whole band has watched the videos and they are all in agreement that, that, uh, tempos are creeping? Uh, I didn't read that from his message. I, I, I don't know either way. What I read was that he's watched the vid videos and he is aware that they are speeding up their songs. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would, if they all watch it together and they are in agreement, that would be certainly a start, you know, like admitting you have a problem would be the step to problem. If not, I think it's useful to, because there are all sorts of tools now where you can have something tell you what beats per minute are, and you can just prove it categorically, right? Like yes. how much is, how much is happening. So that would be another thing to do is like literally get one of these tools on your phone, measure it. And, you know, report out, you know, like, here's what's going on. I know for me, when, well, when tempos are wrong, it's it's really hard to relax and enjoy because you worry and wonder if this is, it's going to be all night like that, right? Right. So in my mind, you, you I tighten up a little bit like that. There are also some songs that are just really hard to sing and or play at, at you know, at the wrong tempo. 
So, you know, these are ones that I would make a bigger issue about. I have to say, to start this conversation, though, I'm still fascinated. Because I've asked you this. I've said, isn't it the drummer's job to maintain steady tempo? And your answer has consistently been, it's the whole band's yeah. accountability. Yeah, absolutely. I, don't, I, I, I still don't understand it. Oh, if you've got a guitar player that's that, or a keyboard player, whatever, I, like I've I've played with with folks who can't keep time, and it is at best super distracting. I, like I I won't play with them. Like I mean I, I and I certainly don't mean to sit here and say that my time is perfect. It's not. You, you know I there are times where I count songs off at the wrong tempo or I, you know, will speed something up or slow something down and not realize that there's also times where I will do that intentionally. Uh, and that's a, I think a different conversation, but, um, but if, if I'm playing with somebody that, that can't keep time, like I, that sucks. It's awful. So you're saying as a, as a drummer, if a rhythm guitar player is, or a keyboard pushing, player, pushing, yep. Well, I'm just saying another, yeah, another, another band instrument. Member. Yep is pushing, pushing, pushing. You as a drummer can only do so much to maintain steady before you have to either figure out whether you're going to go with that guy. He's just going to draw you into, yeah, he's going to interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And, and I mean, like, like I'll take fling for example, right? Like Russ are, who mostly plays rhythm guitar when, when fling plays live, uh, he certainly plays some solos, but but he is the driving rhythm player, uh, you know, it, it, uh, at least playing cor of chordal instruments. Uh, he has a tendency to push tempos, both with starts of songs and and also just through songs. We definitely play Fling as a band that plays on top of the beat. And we do have a natural tendency as a band to speed things up. It's generally not terrible we do keep each other in check. I mean, Russ and I have known each other. We've been playing together for like 15 years, maybe more now. Um, I, so like we know how to do that together, but it was definitely a conversation that we had early on. It was like, Hey man, you know, I don't know if like we need, I, I like you said at the beginning of this, you know, awareness as the band together is important. And, and I think how you have that conversation is also important. It's like, let's not point fingers of blame, Yeah. Let let's just talk about it and acknowledge that. Yes, we, and, and that's how Russ and I had the conversation. It was like, okay, look as fling, we tend to be, you know, a little amp. The clam bake was the same way, same way. Hypnotic clam bake. Like it was, in fact, it was, it was discussed by our band leader that at, if, if anything, we should be speeding up songs. We should never, like take the foot off the gas. It like, th this is a zany band. It needs to go fast. And, uh, and fling, I wouldn't call zany, but it's power pop. Right. And certain songs need to sit in a groove, but a lot of them are, are great when they have a little bit of extra gas, you know, added to the, to the tank later on in the, in the, in the, you know, in the song as the song progresses. So, but it's, it's good to be aware of it. Like, and, and then you can decide as a band, Oh, wow, okay, I, you know, I don't like how that song sounds when it speeds up. So let's be more aware, like you said, Paul, you know, in specific songs about this. And that will teach you to be more aware in general too. But just, just like highlighting the problem, like you said, watching the videos together with the band, you'll find the things that you might want to fix. Just, and, and, and but awareness is step one, which is where, you know, Jonas is starting here. And I think, I think that's great. Um, yeah. Asking the question is, is a great place to start. The yeah. other thing I would say is you should be aware at the point at your show where the adrenaline is starting to build. And when you, when you are prone to this issue, yes. right. Yes. And you know, the best advice I, I not even come for you, Dave is the best advice I've ever gotten about that is to not be afraid to take a pause and hear the original song in your mind before you count something off or, or play an opening, like, like yep. take the moment to like go back to the source in your brain because you probably know it so well. That's why you chose it to be in your, in your band. And, uh, and uh, so th those two things, like be keenly aware when the high energy parts of your show and you tend to have, you know, testosterone kick in and, and yeah, get you going. Adrenaline goes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was it and, was explained to me by 
uh, this guy, Rick Castillo, who's the singer and bass player in the responders, a band I played in in Connecticut a long time ago. And, uh, he's about, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 years, my senior and had played a lot of gigs. And he played in a band for a number of years with Barry Tashin, who was in that band, the remains. And he said what Barry would do and what Barry taught him was, it was exactly this. Take a minute, breathe, and don't just hear the song in your head. Feel it in your body. Like get, and he's like, Barry would like get his body moving to the song before he either counted it in or started playing it on, you know, on his, on his instrument or whatever. And, uh, and he's like, it, you know, there was so, it was so much better to afford yourself that, you know, five to 10 seconds of what is effectively silence, you know, dead air to get your body into the right tempo than it was to have to play four minutes of a song at the wrong tempo, it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's I like I can I, I, my guess is we all can, but I certainly can attest to that starting a song too slow or too fast, especially if it's like a party band or a dance band where once the song starts, if people are dancing, I unless it's a super big emergency, I will not change the tempo. Right. Like once the crowd is moving with us, we are where we are, you, you know, so if the tempo is going to change, it's usually in the first two to four bars of the song. If we've realized, Oh crap, like we started this way too fast. Like, okay, let's fix it right away or, or just live with it, you know, and that's how it's going to be. Um, but yeah, get like, like I, I, I think get your move, feel your body. And if you don't have time for that in your set or that doesn't work for you, do what I've been doing in uptown where I have the, you know, cause some of these are, most of these are songs I did not pick. Right. So I don't have them in my bones yet. A lot of the new songs that we've added, you know, I mentioned that, um, that the look song by, by Roxette, that if that's too fast, it's a disaster. Same with Dua Lipa's levitating. And these aren't, these are songs I've heard certainly, but I, like, I don't know them yet. And so I put the, the the tempo just as a visual tempo in my iPad. So at least I'm starting it where it's supposed to be. And then having that in my head throughout the song keeps me sort of, you know, in check. It's like, no, remember where you counted it. Like I remember learning it, you know, in that moment from the flashing iPad that I have down there. Okay. Got it. And then the flashing goes away after like, you know, 10 measures or whatever. Like I, you know, I don't have it running through the song, but it gives me enough to get going. And it's like, yeah, man, now I know where I am and I know where I'm supposed to be. It's fine. I can trust that that's the right place to be. And a lot of times, especially with a song, I don't know the confidence of, yep, this is the right tempo. Not did I start the right tempo? That's a huge thing. So, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I, as the drummer, I'm fully happy to take responsibility for that part of things. Sure. Like, Nope, this is where it's supposed to be. We're going to be here. That's fine. But I also am fine if somebody else in the band takes that responsibility, like a musical theater. It's usually the keyboard player. We had a sub mm-hmm. this weekend because my friend Julius didn't, didn't, uh, didn't finish the run. Cause he had to go to New York to start the rehearsals for mean girls. So we had a sub this weekend and I told that guy, I'm like, if you don't know a tempo, look at me, I will give it to you or I'll count the song in whichever you would like. But I, you know, I've, I've done this show more times than I can count. Like I, I know where this, you know, this particular cast is used to hearing this song. So trust me. And, and by and large that happened. There were, there were a few moments, but you know, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, similar to the pain that going too fast or too slow has is the pain of a band fighting itself on tempo mid song. Yep. Right. So yep. someone trying to push, someone trying to pull it back that destroys groove. I mean, that just, I mean, it, you, you probably can get away with going a little fast or even moderately faster if the whole band is there. Yes. S- slower is a little harder in dance gigs, but you know, yep. I've, I've seen lots of songs, you know, as long as they're, you know, slow, slower, but grooving still can hold their own. But man, that sense when, you know, two guys in the band or, you know, the rhythm section and, or, you know, when you're fighting for tempo, and it just throws off everybody's confidence by the song. And actually, I I might chalk that up to what I was saying before about bitches back is is uh, you know tacit agreement on the tempo. Oh it, yeah, it has to has to be locked in. You need that. If you don't have that, it's that then then you've got some problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I gotta say, my drummer Don 
is a is a time machine, man. He is he is rock steady. I, I mean, and it's one thing you can take to the bank. Like if he starts a song in a certain, you're going to end the song at that mm. at that rate as well. And you know, it, and it's post gig when you might say because that there have been times where I'll count something, and then he enters, and it feels a, a hair one direction or the other to me. Yep. And I don't, and I've actually experienced that with lot, with lots of drummers. Right. And I don't know whether, I don't know where that lies, whether, whether it's a combination of my count versus what a drummer hears the song is supposed to be in their head, regardless of my count. Yep. Are they really focused on my count? Right. Yeah. F- but, fair. You know, yes. I, yeah. I know what you mean. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But a quick, a quick conversation and that song will always be right after that. So I, I, I mean, it, there's a lot of amazing things about Don, but his metronome is freaking amazing to me. It's That's it's, great. it's just a yeah joy to play with. That's great. It, yeah, as long I mean, it like to to your question before, like the drummer can be the timekeeper in the band, right? But it it's if you've got somebody that's fighting that, I'm not gonna fight all night. I'm just gonna go with it. Like it's like no, okay. We're just going to, well, play. I mean, it, with, but, within reason, I, I played a gig that, that comes to mind where the keyboard player was just like the tempo was all over the place up and down all night. I'm not going to go with that. I'm going to turn that off in my ears and I'm just going to play the gig. Y- you know what I mean? Like, and maybe I won't play with that person again, but, um, it, but you know, but if it's, if it's something where the whole band is like pushing to go faster, it's like, I'm not going to fight the band. I, like, you know, unless, right. unless the song really needs to be, you know, in a pocket and then maybe right. I, maybe I won't fight the band, but or maybe I will fight the band. Right. But otherwise it's just like, no, if, if everybody's pushing like fine, like I'll just go with it. It's fine. It's fine. Because it's it's because that's better than having that weird like it's great when you have a pocket where like the bass player is playing ahead of the beat and the drummer's playing behind the beat, like blues can work really well like that, you know. But when there's actually a fight happening on stage about yeah. it, then the pocket's weird. Like it's not good. <laughs> sure. So yeah. Yeah. But usually like if, if people decide, like if the band decides, oh, okay, well, the, the drummer's the timekeeper, then the drummer's the timekeeper, you know? And, and if, if the conversations for tempo are going to wait until after the gig, like you were saying, then that's fine. Like that works out great. It's like, okay, you know, if I'm, if I'm the guy, then I'm the guy. And if I'm wrong, we'll talk about it at set break or whatever. It's fine. You know, we'll tweak yeah. it for the next time. There's no problem with that. But yeah, if somebody feels like hey, they're going to push it faster and we're not going to talk about it, I'm just going to go with them. It's fine. Like it's better than better than having a weird groove because you've got two people with different opinions about the tempo. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that helps, Jonas. Folks, send in your thoughts to us. Feedback at giggabpodcast dot com. We love to hear this stuff. We love to to dissect this stuff. We re- what I really love about Jonas's question is that it you know came out of a a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago. And he wanted a different angle on it. And so, yeah, here we are. It's great. It's awesome. What else do we have, man? You have anything else or are we, uh, are we good this week? I'm good, bro. Right, I'm good, man. bro. Yeah. Same, same fun stuff. It's good to be back at it. Uh, Oh, after that five gig weekend, I, you know, finished the last gig at whatever, four o'clock on Sunday at 10 AM Monday morning, I was on a plane to Denver for podcast movement. Mm-hmm. So it was like, yeah, I was like, Oh, look, look what I did to myself. This is amazing. <sighs> it's fun though. I, you know, it all works out. It's good. I, uh, but I'm happy to be back again. Feedback yeah. at giggabpodcast.com, folks. We want to hear from you. In the meantime, what advice do we have for him, Paul? Always be performing, people. Always. Good advice. <laughs>